Okay, hi everybody. I think we're just about there. We're exactly there. And welcome to our continuation of a treatise on cosmic fire in depth. And um, Michael, if you're back on, can you kind of tell me which program this is? I, if you can look that up, I, I'm needing to find a way to mark these out. Oh, well, there yeah. it is, isn't it? Yeah, this is program <laughs> 28 that we're, that we are beginning. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. I, I didn't even see my own marker. All right, thank you. And I'd like to uh, welcome you here uh, so far uh, with uh, Michael uh, being very helpful in all things, of course, and then welcome to uh, Andy and Annette and uh, Anthony, Barbara, Catherine, Heike, and Ishtar, and Joan, and Johi, Karen, and Manish, Margot, uh, Martin, Miro, and uh, Vicky. I think, I hope I got everybody there, but of course, if people join a little later, then I can't really review that. <clears throat> well, you know, we're, let's see if I, yeah, okay. Just want to make sure that all my ducks are lined up here. <laughs> um, it's It's not possible I think to go through the beginning of this uh, book, and we're still in the beginning, without a lot of uh, definition of terms. And since there are so many footnotes from the secret doctrine to which um, uh, Master DK contributed and Master KH, and, and I suppose Master M to some extent, I'm not sure, um, but they didn't use the same language, and Blavatsky's language is different from Master DK's language. So, therefore, there are many definitions that are offered, and we have to make them coincide to a certain extent. So I think that the beginning work here is not easygoing, especially if we take the footnotes into uh, consideration. But at least we will be exposed uh, to the uh, foundation. And later things will begin to flow along. Uh, as kind of a segue, we had looked at footnote number seven, giving the definition of the ring pass knot when it's used in occult uh, literature. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, used to denote the periphery of the sphere of influence of any central life force. Now, obviously, depending upon the intensity of that life force, the point of tension at which it exists, so will be the radius uh, of, ex of extended influence. Uh, if, if we're talking about a man, it's one thing. If we're talking about a planetary logos, it's another. So this is uh, this term, the ring pass knot, RPN, uh, is applied especially equally to all atoms, says DK, from the atom of matter as dealt with by the physicist or chemist uh, through the human and planetary atoms up to the great atom of the solar system and not only up to. So we have, um, but for practical purposes, yes. Um, we have here maybe seven main atoms and some subsidiaries in there. The atom 
of matter and um, well, there are constituents of the atom of matter too. They're, you know, they're, they're made up of these um, uh, bubbles in the coilon, as they are called. And each one of them is a tiny constituent of the atom. Well, that too would have its own ring pass knot. Is there anything smaller? Well, maybe. The atom of man, the atom of the planetary logos, you know. So the planetary, within the, within the planetary logos, um, I'll, I'll just put it this way. Um, within the, okay, I think that's, that's not what I want. With, um, but I'll, I'll put in what I want. Within the planetary, uh, chains, I think, yeah, within the planetary scheme, there are planetary chains. Now, we've seen what they look like, uh, at least in a diagram, and maybe I can go there and find something for us. Yeah. Um, so these, just trying to get that a little bit straight, these are planetary schemes, like our Earth. Our Earth is uh, in its full schemehood, <laughs> is portrayed down here, quite square. And of course, we can get into the, the geometry of it, and I do later. Um, I do later in the commentary. And I was wondering, Michael, um, I sent a copy of this particular uh, phase of the commentary to you and Joe. I'm wondering if there's any way people can pick that up or if it can be mailed to them because it would be maybe easier for them to put it on their computer and take notes in that way if they like. But I know this is not the same as go to webinar, so I'm not sure quite how that is done to transfer documents in uh, Zoom. I but anyway, I would. Yeah, I don't, don't think I can transfer the document to them at this point. Okay. Well, maybe what we can do then is mail it to their email or something like that. Um, if we have the people who are generally attending if, if we do. Um, and we can actually send it to everybody. Okay, a little bit of a hiatus there, but I'd like you to be able to have the commentaries that I have written out on Makara. Now I'm making little changes as I go, but you can uh, go to Makara and you can download one phase of the commentary after another and uh, maybe that's the way to do it but maybe whichever is most easy and, and we'll discuss it because i'd like you to have that well anyway notice that within a planetary scheme which is the entirety of the planet there are at least seven planetary chains and maybe even three invisible making 10, but that's a speculation. There are, so seven planetary chains, they are atoms. And when you look at the little dots um, that are within these apparently little circles, they too are wheels and they too are atoms and have their inner life at the very heart of the atom. In other words, a planetary logos is the very center of the planetary scheme. A chain lord is the life at the very center of a planetary chain. A globe lord is the life at the center of a planetary globe, of which there are at least 49, and we live you know, we don't just live on a hunk of earth here. This is the physical body of a 
uh, uh, yeah, a globe, physical body of a globe lord who has its own vehicles going all the way up to the monadic and so forth. They are all atoms too, okay? So I'm just making a list of atoms that we will have to <clears throat> consider. Uh, then there's that atom called the solar logos and that great life at the heart of that atom has a ring pass knot, you know, going to the, well, who knows how far, certainly to the end of its uh, physical demonstration. But really, these ring pass knots exist on subtle levels as well. And they go far beyond the physicality of things. Then, I'm just, you know, giving a list. We might have seven major stars together or something like that. We'd, we'd call it a constellation. Uh, well, there is a constellational lord, the lord of the constellation. And that constellation, too, is considered an atom. And the, um, the uh, planetary schemes are like chains to it. So there's a Lord in, at the present of, presence of a cosmic logos. And then we come to that interesting being that <laughs> we're almost advised not to talk about. Um, <clears throat> we come to this uh, one about whom naught may be said. And here's where it is, up here. And that great being contains seven major constellations and probably many, many more. So it contains lots of atoms called cosmic logoi. But it in itself is an atom. And, it, you know, we call it a super cosmic uh, logos. And I could go on with this. There are these big circles, they are atoms too, and so is this triangle. We don't even know exactly what it refers to, but <clears throat> when the big circles are considered, they have seven major atoms within them, and each one is a one about whom not may be said as far as I can understand. And then comes something superior to that. And I think it all ends, well, it doesn't end, okay? The whole universe is an atom, <laughs> which is an interesting idea. Uh, so we have a super cosmic logos. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll say here, no, I know this stuff is far out, but okay, that's just how it is. Uh, with um, constellations as atoms within it. And finally, you know, I, I don't know by how many steps, but certainly not just seven, we get to something called a galaxy. And a galaxy can have billions of stars. A galaxy even, it's been astonishing what they've been discovering, can have trillions of stars. And these island universes are ruled or informed by a tremendous life. And they too are atoms, even though they seem to be great uh, universes on their, in their own right. So the idea of atom, we usually think of it as such a small thing. It is ubiquitous, everywhere found throughout cosmos, the universe itself being an atom. And you know, if I was to get into the philosophy of it, and step out of the Mahamaya of the universe, 
then we would somehow realize that all the different atoms seem to be hierarchically arranged, big and little, but they're finally all of the same size. Now I'll, you know, if you want to come to identify as being, uh, I can explain that. I won't deviate here uh, for, for that kind of explanation. But always there's an intense life at the heart of an atom, the very center of an atom. And now here's the interesting thing. The sphere of influence of the central life force usually is uh, stopped at a, um, at a certain boundary where the vehicles of the being are found. But with man, there has been the, gives a hint, um, the addition of technology. And you know, even though your radiatory influence in the past may have been just as far as your mental body extends, now you can technically extend your mental body to any point on earth and cover the entirety of our earth, or at least our little globe. We don't know anything else, you know, not probably other globes and other chains and all that, may, maybe not. But as far as reaching the far reaches, <laughs> of the earth, we have the technical means to do that. So it, it puts the whole question of ring pass not in a new light. Now, um, what I would want to say is the average human being maybe has a ring pass not that extends as far as uh, his or her mental body. But what about somebody polarized in the causal body. It's a much greater extent, much more subtle, and can reach many, many souls. What then is the ring pass knot? It, it's not necessarily just the stuff or the matter of the higher mental plane out of which the egoic lotus or causal body is created. We don't say, here's the wall, that's it because the radiation of the causal body goes much, much farther. I think I deal with this somewhere here, but we start adding bodies. We start organizing our bodies. There comes a time when we organize our buddhic vehicle, a little bit before the third initiation, but definitely afterwards. What's the ring pass knot of the buddhic vehicle. It may have a certain extent, but on the other hand, it also demonstrates the principle of non-locality. In a way, it's everywhere. The same for the atmic vehicle in the spiritual triad. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know, I never know in a course like this how much experience we all have, but um, you know, uh, but these are the triadal points, and around these permanent atoms, vehicles are organized, made of the stuff, the atomic matter that is um, found on these different planes. So materially, the ring pass knot may be of a certain extent, but in terms of effective um, radiation and what can be reached, it, it goes much farther than just the extent of the material vehicle found on a particular plane. Same for the atomic plane. There is a monadic vehicle. What's the ring pass knot? Well, we know nothing about size and dimension there, but we do know 
about non-local oneness and maybe, you know, identification with the whole planetary ring pass, not possibly. So much beyond the stuff of which the vehicle is made, I guess this is the point, the influence of the central radiatory life extends and on and on and on as we are unveiled plane after plane, subplane after subplane, until our ring pass knot becomes the boundary of any particular universe because we are restored to our condition of that great emanating life. We're no longer just a part or a piece, we're the one. So I've, I've tried here now then to extend the idea of the ring pass knot. And obviously the higher the point of tension at which we live, the more extensive will be the ring pass knot. So if a, a point of tension is called focused immovable will, if we intensify that focused immovable will and we you know, concentrate upon it so it reaches a ever higher uh, a vibratory location, our ring pass knot is just going to continue to expand. And it doesn't necessarily have only to do with how far the stuff of which our vehicle is made is extending. I already explained that with respect to the causal body, which, you know, has a certain diameter and shape and, you know, elongated spherical oval. oval uh, it's got measurements because it's still within the causal body. I mean, sorry, it's still in the dense physical body of the solar logos. You can measure these things, actually. I mean, they can, the masters can, we can't yet. But whatever that measurement may be, um, the ring pass knot uh, is really bigger when we start getting up into the spiritual realms. I remember uh, Tui and I were in uh, Tallinn, Estonia, and uh, uh, the Dalai Lama was, uh, we were waiting in a, church where he was going to give a lecture and then a lecture basically to the whole city um, and you could feel when his, his approach he was far away he didn't he didn't arrive right away but you could feel the radiation um, what vehicle was it i don't know but he, you could feel the radiation growing even when he was far away and the closer he got, the more intense the radiation was. So let's say he's a fourth degree initiate, you know. There was some kind of extensiveness to this ring pass knot which uh, reached, uh, I don't know what to call it, blocks and blocks, many meters and so forth because First you felt it, then you waited, and then he appeared. So radiation, and when it comes to a great Lord like the Christ, I suppose it's planetarily all extensive in terms of our globe. At least that's what the esoteric Christians say, you know. They're, um, yeah, esoteric Christianity, that has to be explored, but with the truly great and high initiates, the ring pass knot is uh, very extensive in terms of our planetary life. And I guess you could apply the same thing to planetary logoi, going maybe beyond the bounds of the solar system, and certainly to solar logoi, touching other stars and not just limited to their own uh, kind of area, but radiating out and interplaying with other solar logoi. And so 
it goes. Um, there's the ring pass not literal, and there's the ring pass not effective, if I can put it in, in those terms. Uh, now let's see, where am I here? Right here. So we have, um, uh, what can I do? I can do this. Um, I'll, I'll kind of write in this uh, rose colored thing. <clears throat> uh, there is uh, the RPN literal and the RPN uh, radiatorily effective. How do you spell that word? Radiatorily, it probably is not much of a word, but uh, it'll have to do for the moment. Okay, I hope we got the idea. So the more concentrated life we can live at an ever higher point of tension, the more we're going to touch, let's say, keep it in the human race, the more we're going to be able to touch other souls and triads and monads and so forth with the identification becoming ever more, uh, uh, ever more confirmed. So it's up to us how pure we can be, how destructive of obstacles we can be, how well organized we can be. Those are the three energies coming out of Shambhala. And if we apply, apply rightly, purification, destruction, organization, our ring pass knot will really be felt far beyond the measurable reach of our mental body, beyond the measurable reach of our causal body. And then when you start getting into the triad, that you, you just have to deal sometimes with the whole principle of non-locality. Now, if, if ever a ring pass knot deals with the entire planet, then it's the intensity of the radiation that counts. Because basically, with a slightly weaker force, you're touching everywhere. And with a stronger force, you're still touching everywhere on, on the globe but with more intensity, more registrability, you know, more impact, if I can put it that way. Okay. Uh, the ring pass knot of the average human being is the spheroidal form of his mental body. So that's kind of a starting place. The average human being today is in the Aryan group and not necessarily uh, back in the Atlantean group, although there were plenty of Atlantean Aryans with us at the present time, you know, they are much given to Camomanus and there are emotional ring pass knots too. I mean, how do we deal with emotional telepathy? Uh, also with uh, maybe etheric telepathy and with mental telepathy and with soul telepathy. We're we're touching something beyond our sphere. All right. So, but for the average person today, maybe, the average fairly intelligent person, the spheroidal form of the mental body, which extends, this is the Tibetan writing, which extends considerably beyond the physical and enables him to function on the lower levels of the mental plane. That's, that's the average. Um, so I've, I've, I've dealt with what I previously put here in blue, um, the central force, uh, can be measured against other central forces and the greater the central life force, the greater the, the effective, impactful, uh, radiation. And in essence, the greater the ring pass knot, the greater the potential for inclusiveness. Um, 
the normal ring pass knot is only a barrier to the uh, unevolved. The more we refine our aura or basically uh, refine our vehicles and make them more transmissible or energy through them, the greater our outreach. And if we're going to meditate and help the world, you know, we, we want the radiation to go beyond just our own aura, don't we? DK says, well, you're using the ohm quite a bit, but you're using it ineffectively. So basically, it doesn't radiate much and it gets trapped within your own aura. We don't want that condition. We want transmissibility of the sacred word and of our thought and of our higher energies um, so that we can be effective at a distance. So let's just say uh, uh, we need to master, and it's called action. Uh, let's see, uh oh, no, this is the very thing. I don't want this to happen to me again, <laughs> as happened earlier. Uh, action at a distance. It confuses people so much. How can you be here not touching something? and yet move it. I saw, you know, uh, sometimes videos are made and you see some things that you wouldn't think would be possible, but it was some time ago and it was a, a Russian woman and she had these etheric gifts and by moving her hand, she could make something in a glass jar move around according to how she moved her hands. Well, you know, maybe we just accept that and we say, oh, sure, that's possible. Well, it was visible. It was visibly possible. <laughs> and then I saw a Chinese video of someone who really had mastered the chi. And there was a patient on the other side of the wall. And the master of this chi, chi gung, I don't know, he, he basically lifted a leg of the person etherically from a distance of 20 feet through a wall without the person knowing at all when he was going to do something and there it stayed until he lowered it again action at a distance was he touching well the normal materialist will say well he didn't touch her but the etherist <laughs> knows that in fact there was an etheric touching and a kind of uh, overpowering of one uh, etheric system by another. So I think what we need to do more and more in our meditation is to uh, make not just the mental body, but our causal body, uh, the atom in which we work, and that the subtle extent of the causal body has to define our ring pass knot and not the more limited extent of the lower mental body. So that's going to be one of our meditative objectives. And if we can center our consciousness in the causal body, that step will be taken and we can work subtly, subjectively, far afield. And then will come uh, buddhic work and atmic work and eventually monadic work. Maybe that's far enough for us to consider the subject. But different points of tension will define the inner, the central life force for us as we continue to evolve. We are this central energy, this essence, and we are trying to liberate, unveil the essence, uh, intensifying its effect upon our environment near or far. 
we have to keep up our meditation, our study and service uh, to do that. I want you to have a copy of, of this, um, you know, of these um, commentaries. It's quite a few going up, you know, about to page 1100 and something in Cosmic Fire. And then after that, it's all verbal. Uh, and you can get those on Makara too, if you want to study in depth. Um, let's see if there's, I think I've, I've made the point. Now, the next thing, as we move along at a snail's pace, um, is concerning page uh, 42. Let's see what we have here. The tabulation on page 42 may make the idea somewhat clearer. And I think this is the tabulation. Okay. And um, we have different kinds of fires, uh, really amounting to five, to a five pointed star. Maybe two internal fires two fires of mind, and one divine flame. They have names, in a way. Um, the internal fire is called primordial, and it's connected with the third ray, the ray of intelligent activity, and with the type of motion that is called rotary. It does not progress on its own. The cosmic law connected with it is the law of economy and its quality. Hmm, it's fire by friction. Okay, let me get this correct. Fire by friction. Well, these are, you know, these tabulations are meant to clarify the mind and in the beginning of a book like this and we're still in the beginning um a lot of things are laid out to create a solid mental foundation remember a treatise on cosmic fire is not written on the second ray the five volume set called the treatise on the seven rays is written on the second ray but this book is written on the third ray and the first ray. The next two fires are fires of mind, and they relate more to what's called the divine ray of love. Love and mind are, are suggesting Venus, a combination of ray two and ray five most prominently, and of course even ray six the home of the planetary logos of the sixth ray. Now, this is important. Every time DK uses the word home, I leave the father's home and turning back I save, he really means the monadic level. So Uranus is the home of electric fire. Well, we learn on page 420 or 421 right in there in Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1, that Uranus has a first ray monad. It's its esoteric ray, and it's the home of electric fire. Venus is the home of the planetary logos of the sixth ray, so at least one of the monadic rays has to be the sixth, though its sole ray is the fifth. So watch for that word home, where it may now and then appear. Uh, and even, but sometimes the word divine can be contrasted with spiritual in a similar way, only divine means the higher two um, subplanes of any sevenfold system. Spiritual means the next lower three, and then we have the ordinary material um, the lower three subplanes. So it's, um, 
logoic and monadic are divine in, in this way of thinking. Uh, atmic, buddhic, and higher monastic are spiritual, and lower monastic, atmic, uh, lower monastic, astral, etheric, and physical are considered um, dense physical. Uh, and they are the uh, intelligence areas. So here we have two fires of mind. You know, we're going to fill out that five-pointed star here eventually. Two, two material fires, two mental fires. Um, basically what we have, I haven't drawn it out, but uh, if I could, you know, just kind of use my finger to to scry a little bit here, <laughs> we have um, set at the topmost point, which means being, but also connected with the first ray, sat, chit, ananda, sat, chit, ananda. You know, every once in a while, a Swami comes along with a compound name. Uh, so, uh, like Swami Chitananda, that kind of thing. Uh, or Sat Chitananda, all the three. Sat, Chit, and Ananda. And the lower two um, points of the star are called Nama Rupa. So we have Sat Chitananda. It really, in order, it should be Sat Ananda Chit. Uh, one, two, three. And then uh, Nama Rupa, name and form, which are the material fires and probably have to do with fire by friction. But the mental fires have to do with solar fire and with uh, the Agnish Vatas. Notice that Agni is always going to be at the front of those words. Agni. Uh, Agni Shvata, Agni Suryan, astral and Buddhic, Agni Chaitan, physical and atmic. There's higher Agni uh, Agni Shvatas, higher and lower mind. There's higher Agni Suryans, Buddhic, and the lower astral. And there's higher uh, Agni Chaitans, uh, Atmic, and uh, sort of the volcanic fires of the uh, etheric physical plane on the normal, you know, systemic levels. So anyway, here's the fire of mind. He's going to divide it in two at some point here. He's calling it the love ray or the divine ray when compared to the primordial but i just wanted to alert us to the fact that divine is often separated from spiritual and from material so it's another use of the word divine and the aspect here is intelligent love where does it come from well we studied earlier that even though we're dealing with will, love, and activity, we're not going all the way up to the cosmic will plane, the cosmic love plane, and the cosmic uh, higher mental plane. We're probably staying within the realm of Agni. Where is Agni, as I tried to show us before? Well, from one perspective, Agni can be found on the lower four cosmic mental subplanes, the seven cosmic astral subplanes, the four cosmic etheric subplanes, and the three cosmic dense subplanes. This 18 fold system is the realm of Agni, considered as the um, personality of the solar logos.
So there's many ways we can apply Agni, and it probably keeps, you know, going up there. The, you know, we have Varuna, who is uh, ruling the Earth's astral plane, but we also have higher correspondences to Varuna, and we're not given names for these. We have the three Buddhas of activity, but there are two sets of higher correspondences to those Buddhas. And we're not really given the name, they're called like lives or existences or something of that nature. Uh, get into Cosmic Fire, I think it's 873, as if I remember correctly, 873, something like that. And it shows about the three Buddhas, a higher three and a higher three. So when we talk about Agni, sometimes we're just talking about the fire of the systemic mental plane. But other times we're talking about the whole personality of the solar logos. And there are these still, still higher beings for which this whole thing is just a great etheric physical plane. And there would be some kind of higher correspondence of Agni there as well. Well, we don't have to take it too far. We just have to get the analogical principle operating in our mind. We have to learn to think analogically. Mm. Then comes the highest fire, which is equated with Sat. Uh, just the way Chitananda is uh, associated with mind and Nama Rupa with the internal fires, um, it's the ray of will. And that will be the dominating energy of the next solar system. But look, we're only halfway through our present solar system. Just halfway through. So what does that really mean? It's a long time until the next solar system. That's what it means. Um, I'm just trying to make this big enough because I find that I have to sit back here a little bit uh, somehow. When you sit for too many hours in the day, you know, it uh, can make you into a pretzel. So anyway, um, divine flame. Sometimes there's, there's a difference between flame and fire. And the use of these words is very refined. And unfortunately, it's not entirely consistent. But let's just say there's the primordial ray, the divine or love ray, and the will ray, OK? And the aspect is still coming from Agni. It's intelligent will. And I showed how these things derive from the cosmic mental plane, basically. The expression is forward motion, forward progressive, driving onward through space. The energy of, uh, what do we call it? Uh, progress onward. Now it's quite obvious, isn't it? That if you've got something circling in place and you start applying forward motion to it, or this way, whichever way you want, you're gonna get a spiral. So spiral cyclicity is the result coming from the combination of ray three and ray one. Ray one is the father, ray three sometimes is considered the mother and the son aspect, whether it's S-U-N or S-O-N, uh, arises from the combination of the two. Uh, as, as I'll get into, the mother aspect is sometimes four and sometimes it is three. And there just seems to be no particular rhyme or reason to it. But when the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, 
it's a kind of a Cancerian expression, you had both the Holy Spirit and the mother. The waters represented the mother. The moving Holy Spirit um, represented the third aspect. And together they uh, cooperated to create Nama Rupa, you know, name and form. The law involved here, the three cosmic laws that are usually discussed, there are more, and um, one day we'll have, uh, Michael's been doing a lot of research on law. And uh, so, you know, he can present certain things to us about this. But anyway, the three laws usually uh, discussed are the law of economy, third ray, law of attraction and repulsion, second ray, law of synthesis, that's the first ray. And there's other laws, uh, you know, uh, probably maybe certainly systemically, solar systemically, there are seven great laws. Uh, vibration, cohesion, disintegration, um, magnetic control, is that what it's called? Uh, number five is fixation. Number six, the law of love. Number seven, uh, the law of something and death. Um, two names, and I'm, I'm forgetting one of them. Um, but anyway, they relate to the solar system. These three go beyond the solar system. And there, the qualities of fire involved are the three fires that we are studying in this book. Fire by friction, that's our first hundred pages, roughly. And, you know, that's, if, if you're a, a study of human, a student of humanism, <laughs> You're you're a, a study a student of literature. You're a student of art and uh, all those you know bell letters, all those kind of things. You may not be so inclined to study matter per se. So you know, rays two, four, and six. They don't study matter very much. Rays one, three, five, seven, they study it more. But we have to engage first in the study of matter and form. And that's what we're doing now. The very last part of the book, which maybe we will reach or someone will reach, is all about electric fire with maybe, I don't know, uh, 800 pages or so in the middle that are all about solar fire because that's our main focus. So this tabulation should line things up in our mind and help us know the names of certain things relating to the three aspects of divinity and also to the divisions within those aspects. Okay, so, um, you know, the spiral cyclic motion is definitely a secondary motion, but I found one reference where strangely he related it to the first ray. I don't know how to account for it, except that without the first ray, there would be no spiral. The second ray alone won't produce it. You have to have antecedents, uh, precursors of the first and third ray to produce the spiral. Notice the word flame, uh, well maybe it's not right here, but usually the word flame is related to a very high type of fire. And somehow um, there's, a, there's a wonderful definition about uh, um, a unit, maybe a monad or something, 
hanging from the great divine flame and attached via the thinnest strand of cosmic electricity or fohat. Now we had, you know, uh, what I did basically, I taught a lot of classes on this, or did it teach me? You know, I feel like I've done 2% out of this book. Um, I, I went home and I organized what the, not only what I said, that was pre-organized, but what the group thought, and I tried to organize that. Um, when comparing the three modes of motion, the third ray has the problem of separativeness because it rotates, it doesn't revolve. It rotates on its own axis and that rotation is repulsive to other rotating units. So individualism is emphasized by the uh, Individualism is emphasized by the third ray. And maybe that's why it's so difficult. I think it's called the divine separator or something like that. Let's see if I can, um, I'll, I'll use yet another instance of the Alice Bailey books and go to Esoteric Psychology Volume 1 and with hope in my mind and heart, um, I'll turn to the purposes of deity and the names of the lords, and there it is, right in front of my nose, and I'll try to make it in front of your nose too. <laughs> Here it is, the divine separator. And notice, you know, right here, and notice that it is a ray of discrimination. So um, it takes things apart in a way and weaves them back together, we might say. But it is acutely aware of the separation between things, whereas the second ray, much more the commonalities between things. So all these names are wonderful. What I try to do at every conference, lately anyway, is to do one little lecture on the names of the ray lords. Uh, but there is a problem with this rotary motion, ever the same, and remaining disengaged from other vortexes. Somehow we've got to get the vortexes communicating. And maybe that's a more second ray uh, type of process. So, uh, so we rotate on our own axis. We emphasize separation. And we stay, uh, we stay separative. And you know, issues of pride of mind come in here. And in general, mental, uh, mental separation. But revolution is not rotation. And it emphasizes relationship, you know, you can rotate all you like and just be yourself. But when you've got revolution, you've got a revolving body around, let's call it an apparently stationary body. All bodies have their own proper movement through space, but it takes two. The, the earth rotates on its own axis but revolves around the sun. So it takes two and it's connected with the idea of relationship. And it's a, more of a second ray phenomenon. 
Then there's also the whole idea of getting from here to there or setting off on a pilgrimage, as it were. Uh, our, our son, well, let's see, our son is rotating on its own axis. I'm not sure of the detail, but probably every 27 days. The whole solar system is a much, much slower rotation. Our sun is also said to be revolving around Alcyone and those uh, particularly prominent Pleiades. And our sun is driving forward through space with first ray motion on its way towards the star Vega. At least that's what astronomers have determined. So three modes of motion are found with that stellar body. Uh, when it comes to the Earth, at least two modes of motion are uh, easily seen, rotation and revolution. And for the moment, um, if our Earth is going anywhere in a straight line, it's going with the whole solar system. So this is the energy of, of progress onward. Uh, rotary motion, spiral cyclic motion, automatically spiral cyclic. Because if our sun is driving towards Vega, then all of these revolving bodies around it are spiraling along with, uh, because of the sun's onward motion. So we're getting always higher turns of the spiral or, you know, the sense of evolution or of moving onward. Straight lines, spiral cyclic and rotary. Just, we just have to get that in our minds that that's, uh, fundamental. If you want to change the centers around which you um, revolve, you need to go forth using forward progressive motion. Drive forward and find a new center. And this would be maybe a combination of uh, first and second ray types of motion. The first type of motion changes the center to which you are oriented. And the second type of motion establishes a repetitive rotation around a center. So I, I think there are, you know, j just the way students and uh, human beings, they Let's just say they, they study with a teacher and they, as it were, revolve around that teacher and what the teacher has to say. But maybe they want to change teachers. So they drive forward through space on their way to find another central point of illumination. And it takes first ray to get them there. And then they start revolving again around a new center. So changes of relationship still contain the first, second, and even the third ray. Um, if you want to keep relationship exactly as it has been, you don't move, you just keep, you just keep rotating or revolving, let's just say. But if the central point is itself moving, then you'll be moving with it. In other words, if your teacher or source of illumination becomes more luminous, you will rise with that luminosity, or you will fall with the degradation of light. Uh, people in rotary motion psychologically often will say, well, look, I, I'm just tired of what I'm doing, but I'm doing it. I, I need a change of relationship, but I'm in it. I, I need to make a break, but I don't. 
See, that's just rotary motion, and that is the symbolized by the moon, the energy of the moon. It's the past. It keeps you in prison. It keeps you in a rotary prison. And it doesn't allow you really to have revolution which rises. But if you drive forward through space, you leave the old condition behind, and you're changing your relationship quite quickly. Now you have something new around which to revolve. So these types of motion, they can fit into human psychology, be applied on that level, even though they are a great astronomical, esoteric astronomical facts. Uh, driving forward through space changes relationship quickly. Spiral cyclic motion changes your relationship slowly as you ascend. You know how it is, you just quietly outgrow the central source. Sometimes a teacher will say, I've heard it many times, said, well, that's all I can teach you. You've outgrown what I can show you. It's time for you to move on. So after a slow and gentle revolution in which much was absorbed on each turn of the spiral, we reach the point when no more can be absorbed. And then we drive forward through space towards a new center and establish a new relationship. It, it happens all the time. Even when people emigrate, you know, they, they, they become immigrants, they leave their country, they come to a new country, all the relationships change. And all of this can be considered to be a part of a great cosmic, I think we could call it a law, the law of mutation, which is not chaotic, it's, it's very rational but it's just very complex. Everything is changing, but with a purpose. Okay, well, I think, um, I think that's clear enough. These three expressions of the divine life may be regarded as expressing the triple mode of manifestation. First, the object of a tangible universe, Second, the subjective worlds of form, and now he's using the term differently. And thirdly, the spiritual aspect, which is to be found at the heart of all. Where is his word divine? Because divine is so often used instead of spiritual to indicate something still higher. So you've got to be very careful about how the writer is using words because the same word can mean different levels. Now, if you look at what we've got here is subjective, we've got, excuse me, we've got objective tangible. Um, this is the Tibetan writing in black, right? We've got subjective worlds or form very interesting. It's not matter. Okay. Form is not matter. That may, we, we are so careless in our use of words that for many people, form is just matter. But, you know, form is geometry and matter is what fills it in. And thirdly, the spiritual aspect or the divine aspect. So let's look at the map and see. Yeah, we're getting there now. Okay. Well, you know, look, I'm basically what I'm doing is take, trying to take a synthetic approach to fire by friction and to everything else that's in this book and to engage in filling out what the science of relationships indicates. It's just the opposite of what we were doing last night, where we were studying the science of non-relationship. 
and we were working with identification and identicality and infuception and all those words which indicate sameness. Now we are really studying difference with meticulous entirety. So we have, um, let's see, what are these? Excuse me. We have objectivity, subjectivity, and spiritual. Now, on the map, where is it? Given a, a great being, like a solar logos, um, objectivity is the lower three systemic planes. And even though the ethers are subtle, they are still objective. Uh, I might say that subtlety is not subjectivity. But in a way, if he's going to call subjective the world's a form, they are the geometry which order the acquisition of matter. In other words, here's the form, it's a field of geometry, and it's filled in by matter. Okay. So from another point of view, uh, the formal world is the higher four cosmic subplanes called etheric. And these are very, the lower three are very material and very objective. Then comes the spiritual. Now, if we're talking about a sort of logos, we're going to have to begin the spiritual or let's equate spiritual and divine together and say, after you have exhausted 18 subplanes that are cosmic and they're not here depicted, you know, the Tibetan knows what is hopeless, <laughs> we begin the world of spirituality or divinity. And for a solar logos, it involves higher cosmic subplanes which are not here described. That, that's one way of looking at spiritual divine from the point of view of the solar logos, a subjectivity and objectivity. Now we could, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at this, but let's, let's look at man, for instance. The objective uh, has to do with the etheric physical subplane in, in a systemic sense. It's just right down there. The subtle has to do with the astral and the lower mental. The truly subjective begins at the third subplane of the mental plane and continues upward through the spiritual triad. And the truly spiritual begins with the monad on the monadic plane in seven great circles. Your monad is located there. And the liberated monad within three great circles, okay? They look like triangles here. Maybe it just doesn't make any difference. Let's just think about the triangle inscribed within the circle. It all depends on the being. Um, but let us say that at a certain point, e ethericity takes over and there's the design which is filled in by a bunch of stuff, which we call matter. So matter is of the third aspect of divinity and form is more related to the second. We're told God geometrizes. Well, God geometrizes particularly in relation to the second ray 
was called the great geometer or the grand geometer. So the basic thing is always to carry a trinity in your mind, a spiritual divine part, a subjective part, and an objective part. And if I was going to get more technical about it, maybe I would have a fivefold division. Let there be dense objectivity down here. Let there be subtlety involving the four etheric subplanes, the astral subplanes, and the lower mental subplanes. Let there be subjectivity involving the world of the soul and the world of the spiritual triad. Um, and that subjectivity is really spirituality in a way, because it's called the spiritual triad. And let there be divinity or the truly divine, which is the monad and the liberated monad. And that would be another way of dividing the categories. You know, look, if, th if this book is written on the third ray, and the third ray is the essential discriminating life or the great separator, there's going to be a lot of distinctions made as we go along and try to keep things clear and straight in our minds. Okay, so, you know, I'm not so worried about covering a lot of pages. The important thing is to reach out uh, synthetically and pull together the various items of information so they are related to each other within the field, if we are, if we manage, within the field of pure reason. If we can do that, we don't have to cover a lot of pages because we're actually going to understand uh, what is said. And, and, you know, there's all these footnotes here. So if we want to be kind of complete about it and look at it with meticulous entirety and relate the secret doctrine to a treatise on cosmic fire, with the secret, with cosmic fire being a, an extension, a psychological extension of the secret doctrine, <clears throat> we're going to have to wade through this. And it, it requires a lot of patience. So, you know, here are here are these uh, footnotes coming up, but uh, footnote number eight about, you know, the father Mahadeva and the son Vishnu and the uh, mother. Um, Would you like to change your screen share to show those? Oh, uh, where am I? Uh, on the chart of the evolution of the solar logos. Who am I? There you uh, go. You, uh, yeah, this is the one you're talking. Yeah, Mother Brahma, possibly, you know. We've got a lot of divisions of the three aspects, and here we even, here we even seem to have the four. I'm not going to get into it now. I guess what I'm trying to do is teach a mode of approach, uh, a mode of thinking about these things, I'm going to show a footnote here in a minute. Footnote number eight. And we have to consider it next time. And uh, is, it, is it visible? Here, here. Is that footnote visible? No, it it's is. Big, big square, OK. So you know, from unity to duality to trinity, to the sacred four. And the word Holy Spirit is not mentioned, but it should be. And then the mother is the synthesis of it all. We have to get certain definitions in place if we're going to understand how the Tibetan puts all this stuff together. Otherwise, we, we will <clears throat> have confusion. The, the wrong mixing of things, you know, things that should not be mixed together. So 
I'll try to get into this next time. I don't think it'll take too long. And we'll, we will move along. Um, so basically, today, what we've looked at um, well, you know, I, I spent really a lot of time trying to clarify these concepts before being able to really work with them. You know, he said, oh, you theosophists, you just love those difficult terms, don't you? You know, he was a little tongue in cheek when he was talking about that. And our problem is we have many words for the same thing and the same word for different things. So we have to find out how that's really working. Every once in a while, you're just really happy to find a chart which relieves you from all of these words. But th this is an area in the book regarding definition and sort of uh, setting up a series of relationships which will be important as we continue our study. I can't say that the footnotes become less, maybe it seems like they are less, but once you've defined certain things in the material sphere and you've seen how Blavatsky uses words and how Decay uses words, you feel a lot freer to navigate what is coming on ahead. So the next time we get together, if you have the courage to return, <laughs> Um, we're going to get into footnote eight and that which uh, follows it. I write in black, you know, and uh, make maybe just a few comments. Uh, but remember, the five-pointed star, that'll come later, with two material points, two mental points, and one deeply um, spiritual divine point, the very apex. Remember the three types of motion, be able to name them and be able to understand how uh, the, the, the rays they are connected with and how the second ray type of motion which is faster than the third ray type and slower than the second ray type, the, f the first ray type, arises from the combination of father and mother. And, you know, um, remember this chart, this tabulation, uh, which shows a lot of things the quality of the law, the expression, the aspect, the ray, the fire. It's a very useful little, little chart. I think those are the main, and remember the whole idea of the ever-expanding ring pass knot and how technology has vastly expanded man's ring pass knot, even though the natural ring pass knot remains what it always has been. And remember that the greater ring pass knot is associated with ever more subtle vehicular fields. The buddhic ring pass knot is greater than the egoic lotus's ring pass knot. The atmic ring pass knot is greater than the buddhic. The monadic ring pass knot is greater than the atmic. And on we go until, as a monad, we are part of three great circles uh, on the 
logoic plane, even as the Christ and the Buddha are now. So if I can, you know, I don't want to lose my way here. Um, I want to get this correct. And I know it's a little tedious for you to watch, but it'll be, it'll be over soon. Um, this is as far as we went. So, um, right here. Form is not matter. Form is the layout which matter fills in. It's the design. So, okay, so um, was this number 28, Michael, is that it? I think so. 28 and uh, maybe 24. I, I had to redo a program because we had trouble. Right, with 28 for today. And is it is it 28, 23 or 20? Well, anyway, it doesn't make any difference. 28 basically is the is the number and here is uh, on the 28th of august and um it's the end and we got as far as page 41 i think that is correct okay i'm always happy to see at least two pages of um so it'll be 29 and maybe 25. uh you know on makara i sent in a new program it expanded as you might expect, because uh, uh, we had some re recording difficulty along the way. And I try to make up for it if that happens. And it says I've done somehow five solo programs. So I'm not sure how we should mark that. And maybe you can think about that. Part two of the 21st is 53 minutes long and part one is two hours and 30 minutes long but now we're going to what is our day that we're going to go ahead with this it will be the fourth right the fourth of september and we will meet in the morning all right and if ever Tui and i have you know lots of programming that we just can't manage at all will let you know if there has to be a little bit of a, a hiatus. But the next thing we're going to get into, uh, let's say start with, uh, start with footnote eight. And your language, your vocabulary of the foundational concepts will build up. I don't know how carefully you have studied Cosmic Fire before, but if you do go to Makara, you'll find all of those commentaries and there will be slight differences, you know, because I'm right, doing a little bit of writing in and all that, but there's enough to orient you if you want to undertake the big picture with meticulous entirety. So it is there. Uh, and it will take, you know, any student of cosmic fire will realize that this is not going to be done in a day. It's going to take years to really be au fait with the book, you know, to say, well, I may not know much of what's in here, but I know something and it will be a boost in which to envelop, uh, eh, well, I'm mixing my metaphors here, but it, it, it will be a new field in which you can include many of your more particular studies because in a treatise on cosmic fire is the root of white magic, a treatise on white magic, is the root of esoteric uh, psychology. Uh, are, there are important astrological factors that are found in white magic and also in a treatise on cosmic fire. Uh, 
I don't, I don't think there's too much on esoteric healing, uh, but there's a lot on initiation. Uh, so many, it's the seed of many more particularized studies that the Tibetan uh, wrote about in, in much more contained uh, books. So it kind of gets us going with the big picture and how all of these uh, factors are related to each other. So we'll, we'll come back and um, you notice I never stick entirely to the text. I'm always trying to think synthetically and I'm always trying to find relationships within the general field of Master DK's uh, work that are specifically related to what we are studying here. And then once the tedium of getting the foundation uh, is accomplished, uh, things will flow along. And there, you know, there are sections of this book which they read almost like a normal book. But right now we're building the foundation. Okay, are there thoughts, questions, statements, whatever, you know, you might like to bring up? Yes. Um, there was a question about chart six showing the planetary schemes, and that is on page 373 of a treatise on cosmic fire. Right, this, this was uh, two years rendition of it and she kind of clarified, you know, the image. She's done a lot of good work with clarification and color and uh, making the charts more accessible. You know, we, we have, you know, if you had to look at this particular diagram, I'm going to get there now, there, this one. You could look at this diagram uh, from the Tibetan, okay, it's good. Or you could look at the same thing um, this way. And there's much more somehow coloristic information here and a lot more clarity. Uh, uh, Keith Bailey did a lot of color work on this and then Tuya took it even further. Um, and I think, you know, we're getting more and more out of the chart rather than just having uh, this monochrome it, it was the one showing the planetary schemes yeah 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 but yeah, I, I was just yeah, yeah, circle. right i was just giving an example of of how there are differences you know in the tibetans rendering here or whoever did it at the time they had the technology they had and things were a little bit jagged and you know not too precise looking and when it comes to the planetary schemes, we had that particular issue. They just weren't as neatly done, but they were still monochromatic. So anyway, we've been taking the basic chart and improving it for legibility and color symbolism, uh, which I think can be useful. And then... Okay. And Veronica has provided a YouTube link uh, that shows the motion of the sun when it, with its planets in the universe. And that has been put in the chat box for everyone. Yeah, that's, that's good. But Michael, can you copy that and send that to me? Uh, yes, I will. I, I would appreciate it. Thanks, Anne Veronica. Sometimes, you know, when we see it, you know, we can, like, for instance, we can talk about a Taurus, uh, the figure called the Taurus, and we can talk about it. And then when we get an animation going, uh, we say, ah, so that's what you mean. Okay. So right now, our representational capacity 
uh, has uh, greatly increased. And we can begin to see graphically and in motion what otherwise would be somewhat stuck in the realm of words. So that's a big help and thank you. And Yvonne asks, is driving forward an elevation in consciousness? Well, you know, it depends. It depends on the object toward which the driving is occurring. It, it will generally be an elevation in consciousness and an increase of power. But if the person is wrongly motivated, now, let, you know, the lords of form are usually first ray souls or on the first sub ray. And I would say their monadic ray coming from the previous solar system is some example of the third ray. They too are driving forward along the line of Mahat, pure, <clears throat> pure mind, but their objective is separative and intensely uh, selfish. And, uh, you know, they have kind of a name that uh, involves lust and pride. And they are using the first ray a great deal. Uh, now, uh, let's say one of their representatives, Hitler, he had something called the Blitzkrieg, the lightning war. He drove forward rampantly overcoming all opposition. But what was his objective? So I think we cannot always say that driving forward will elevate the consciousness. In a, a, a true aspirant or true uh, disciple of the ageless wisdom, working along the Syrian path, which is the path of initiation for our planet, the, the, the justified path, it will involve an increase of consciousness and of power. But there are other ways to drive forward. And uh, maybe what, what the driver will discover finally is that forward was really backward. You know, they, they have separative objectives which has, have made them lose time. And um, DK puts it this way, they, they have um, gone, now I'm not sure what the verb is, but they have found themselves or driven toward or went far into the land of distances. I wonder if I can I wonder if I can find that. You know, it, it was a peculiar sort of old commentary phrase. Um, here it is, I think. Uh, Letters and Occult Meditation, page 134. The Dark Brothers are, remember this always, brothers. And would you like to, oh, to show uh, it? Yeah. Why not? Okay. The, the Dark Brothers, remember always, are brothers, erring and misguided, yet still sons of the one father. Ah, the word, the verb is straying. Though straying far, very far, into the land of distances. The way back for them will be long but the mercy of evolution inevitably forces them back along the path of return in cycles far ahead. Anyone who overexalts the concrete mind, making it basically the 13th sphere, and permits it continuously to shut out the higher, is in danger of straying 
on the left-hand path. Now, straying, wandering, you know, it's kind of a third-ray word. It means, you know, getting off the track. And I don't know if we can call it driving, but it is leaving behind the good path. Many so stray, dot, dot, dot. Something interesting, you know, is you going to name people who have strayed? Who knows? But come back, and then in the future, avoid like errors in the same way as a child once burnt avoids the fire. It is the man who persists in spite of warning and of pain who eventually becomes a brother of darkness, mightily fights the ego at first to prevent the personality so developing. But the deficiencies of the causal body, for forget not that our vices are but our virtues misused, result in a lopsided causal body, overdeveloped in some direction and full of great gulfs and gaps where virtues should be. So, well, this is, you know, this is a whole kind of chapter on the dark brothers, the brothers of darkness, okay. But it shows that we can go off very far from the correct path. And we can do that once we begin to stray, we can do it with insistence so that we drive ourselves further and further away from the true objective and instead we undertake a false objective. And the time spent getting back is probably proportional to the time spent getting there. It's worth reading this. Okay. What else? Next, Anything else? Next, yes. Anne Veronica has written, too many thoughts, ideas, and questions. I want to deeply thank you for opening my mind into beautiful worlds. Wondering where I found the third ray to read this book. Of course, I understand less than an inkling, but I really love this book. Thank you for That's, giving us a glimpse of this beautiful yeah. divine structure of the universe. Yeah, it's a great book. And, you know, you, you do have, I think, I've kind of watched what you said and how you said it and something third ray, fifth ray uh, is there, I do believe. I, I, can't, I can't make any definitive pronouncement, and I probably never would, about people's ray structure, but you kind of pick up... Um, you kind of pick up indications, you know, by the subjects in which people are interested and how they express themselves. So I, I think you have what it takes to get into this. And um, it'll take you your whole life and more, all of us. Cosmic fire, you know, secret doctrine, how many lives worth of material uh, is in those books? We just have to steadily go along, absorb what we can, apply what we can, and uh, assess the nature of things as widely and deeply as we can. We'll get there. Yeah. And then Chris asks, in physics we say that light is electromagnetic radiation. How would DK describe this function? Well, uh, light is the very substratum of all energy and matter. Uh, he would, I mean, you know, this is a kind of a fifth ray question. I'm not terribly qualified uh, to answer it, but there is a sense that the universe is object, light is objectivity. And the universe is that, even though parts of it seem subjective to us. The great 
source of all is utter darkness. There is no light per se in absoluteness. There's no in. All there is is something so hard to fathom. You know, the uh, utterly infinite beingness. Light is a, a, a tiny unit. Uh, it, it's, as is love, uh, as is intelligence, whatever. They don't really exist in ultimateness. But once we have the appearance out of ultimateness of a universe, light is the fundamental constituent. Uh, in the Kabbalah, basically, everything in the universe is uh, condensed light. And of course, you know, if you want to solve the secret doctrine according to a fifth ray key, then you would get into the whole study of Fohat, which is um, Brahma, which is uh, cosmic electricity. So, you know, what you're talking about would be one of the ways in to understanding. It's just that the electrical phenomena that we are talking about goes so far beyond what we call normal electricity. Basically, we're only studying the third aspect of electricity in its first and second, first ray and third ray sub-modes. We're not studying the neutral electricity. Uh, he talks about that, and he doesn't really define it. And we're not really studying electric fire. We're studying a lower correspondence to electric fire, which is a subcategory of the third aspect of electricity. Now, you know, if someone, there are some theosophists who are trained in physics, I'm not. Um, and they, uh, they study chemistry and physics from a theosophical point of view. So maybe, you know, from, from a chemical point of view, one could read Occult Chemistry by Besant and Leadbeater and see what their observations have been. But I know there are some theosophical books from heavily fifth-rate types uh, who get into esoteric electricity, which is the great actor Fohat, which is, when I say actor, the one who moves, who acts. And there is, uh, Fohat is Brahma, Fohat is Agni, as the personality of the solar logos. So we have Fohat all over, it's a, I think a Tibetan word, we have it all over the secret doctrine, but at the same time, not enough is said about it to really give a definitive uh, description of how it operates. I would say, you know, people who have the fifth ray as their soul ray or monadic ray could turn the key to the ageless wisdom along the line of studying Fohat and cosmic uh, electricity. The electrical terms apply as long as we realize so far that we're only studying the very lowest part of cosmic electricity. It's a bit like Kundalini, you know, uh, it seems like such a first ray force, but it's really fire by friction in its first aspect. It, it's not the first ray force of will and purpose, although sometimes um, will is connected with the base of the spine and 
purpose with the top of the head. Uh, yet, um, basically, we're dealing with the third aspect of energy at the base of the spine in its first ray aspect. And electrically, we're dealing with the third uh, aspect of electricity in its first ray aspect. Uh, when we talk about electric fire, it's not pure electric fire. So I, I, I am just affirming that the electrical, the study of cosmic electricity is a, a legitimate way to approach turning the key to the secret doctrine, but we're only at the very beginning. Our knowledge of electricity is hardly sufficient to cover Fohat and cosmic electricity. Next, we have written in the chat box from Vicki two questions. So when we say a deity like the planetary logos is omnipresent, how would you define this in the context of the ring pass knot? Omnipresent within his own planetary scheme. Uh, successively omnipresent within the solar system and not omnipresent beyond certain faint touches within the cosmic logos. The planetary logos is not universally omnipresent. The consciousness does not extend uh, too far although much farther, it, it, it may in rare cases for the sacred planets extend a little beyond the normal boundaries of its solar system, but it has its severe limitations cosmically considered. So the only guaranteed omnipresence is to be, let us say, the presence within its own planetary scheme and then more faintly present within the solar system. It's, you know, it's a bit like sitting in a room with a group that you're going to work with. The planetary logoi are sitting in the solar systemic room. They all see each other. They're with each other in the same space. They, they know a lot about each other. They are present to each other, but the omni cannot extend throughout the bounds of the universe. It's just too much. It's, it's certainly, I mean, think of it. Our, 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 our solar logos is like a crystal compared to certain lives. That's what DK tells us. Our solar logos much more sentient than a planetary logos is far from omnipresent, but certainly omnipresent within its own solar system in every phase. And it sits in another room with six other major solar logoi and interrelates and knows about them and is present to them and knows some but not all. So the presence begins to fade out the further you extend the ring pass knot you are considering uh, is our solar logos omnipresent throughout the system of the cosmic logos in which it is a heart center uh, in a manner of speaking yes but not intensely present as it is within its own solar system so it proceeds by gradations. And by the time you get to something like an arm of a galaxy, or, well, let's, let's just call it a one about whom not may be said, okay? Is our solar logos omnipresent within this one about whom not may be said? No. It, it, it does not have the extensiveness, uh, the practical extensiveness in consciousness and in um, here-ness or there-ness 
to be omnipresent throughout that great being. But it has a feeling for things and it detects things. And the further you go, the more its omnipresence fades. Now, the only way we can really talk about omnipresence for every being is to lift all the veils and to discover that every being is fundamentally the universal logos. Then every being is omnipresent throughout any particular universe in which it is manifesting. But that's a kind of a philosophical issue and it's not going to happen because the laws of Mahamaya say you're just not going to lift those veils all at once. It's a gradual unveiling as emanative retraction occurs and we take on ever new forms that are more refined with less veiling and eventually at a certain point we realize that we are the wholeness of that being that is the one being in cosmos but that's a, a philosophical ideal and it's not much of a practicality in terms of the long slow unveiling process and that's and about Vic, what i have yeah, yeah. and and vicky continues and in that regard it is said by dkaab that the physical plane is not a principle so then how can a logos be omnipresent well 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 uh it doesn't mean that you see what, what is the physical plane to a logos the physical plane to the to the logos is the three lower 18 subplanes including the physical one day sanat kumara will materialize and walk the earth it all the extension of sanat kumara is already found on the uh, systemic etheric plane and it's just a simple matter of precipitation and gathering this uh, congestion of matter around that etheric body to appear on the dense physical plane. So indeed, uh, the potential uh, of knowing what is happening on the physical plane is there. And just by turning his attention to any point on those lower planes, uh, he is present. The, princi the principal question is maybe a different thing because all that matter from the previous solar system is not his objective. He's not working with it. What he's trying to do is to redemptively convert it so that it aligns with the type of uh, matter and energy which is under development in this solar system. So what, what happens there is eventually planets are going to lose their dense physical body. And even now, DK says that the etheric body is really the physical body. And once the etherealization of the dense physical occurs, um, then there will be only etheric planets, but they will be considered to have a physicality which is etheric. But if I can use the map again, the principles of the planetary logos operate like this. They, let's see, um, maybe a different, maybe this, yeah. The dense physical body of the solar, of the, of the uh, planetary logos is not down here. This is just an earthly kind of excrescence. The dense physical body is the lower 18 subplanes. 
which, in, in which, in relation to which, the planetary logos can certainly be present, but is not doing anything but redeeming those 18 lower subplanes. The dense physical body of the solar logos is definitely the lower 21 subplanes. It's really nothing that the solar logos has to use, but he has to be involved in the redemption of these leftovers from the previous solar system. And his principles really begin up here on the buddhic plane and beyond. We're told that there are two etheric principles. It's kind of, you know, it, prana is certainly one. Um, and then it sometimes says the etheric body of principle, but one is an energy and one is a vehicle. At least that's the way it is for man. But the principled nature of the solar logos begins here on the cosmic ethers and extends not just to the cosmic ethers, but to Kama, to lower Manas, to higher Manas, to Karana Sarira, his causal body, the principle of Buddhi, the principle of Atma. I think that's as high as it goes. Uh, the when it comes to the monad of the solar logos, it's nestled in this third triangle somewhere, and that's the place from which these principles are extending cosmically. So, so my point is, let's be careful when comparing solar systemic principles that, that man is dealing with, and these great cosmic principles which cover cosmic planes, whereas for man, the principles are engaging themselves on systemic planes. So, you know, if there's a parallel, but it's different. And as far as the ability of, of, of Sanat Kumar or the solar logos to be for Sanat Kumara to be anywhere within his own um, system, his planetary scheme, or the solar logos to be present anywhere within his larger solar systemic scheme. That is perfectly possible, even though some of the material with which he engages is no longer the object of his um, attention except to uh, etherealize it or bring it into line with the um, energies of this second solar system, second major solar system. And next, Anne Veronica writes again, the mind becoming the 13th sphere. Lower mind. What spheres is Master DK talking about? Has it to do with the planes? Well, it's a self-contained unit, which is um, consisting of the four lower subplanes of the mental plane, and it deflects all higher energies, which are along the Syrian line of development. He says, it's the worst disaster that can befall uh, a human being and is related to the ill omened number 13. So the lower mind is not meant to seal itself off with this ray five, which basically produces cleavage. Uh, it's meant to be fluidly related to the other levels of mind, but the dark brother is not interested in that. He wants acute mentality on the lower level of mind, and he gets that by driving along a certain Davic line of development 
which is characterized by pure mahat. And the result is he drives himself further and further into the land of distances and becomes ever more separative and, uh, you know, almost like cancerous in relation to the divine plan. <clears throat> so by a sphere, see, sometimes we forget that rays are spheres and planes are spheres. They have a certain extent. And the rays, the planes rotate this way. I think from, does he say east to west or west to east? I'm forgetting, but I think it's east to west. And the rays rotate from north to south. So you've got this kind of wheel turning upon itself of planes and rays and some kind of great design which is considered to be kind of a serpent is the result, the visual result, the energy result of this dual rotation. So, you know, we've got the charts that make everything look like a pancake, you know, flapjacks one on top of another, but in fact, the rays are um, spherical, and so are the planes. Now, some of that representation has been well uh, presented by uh, uh, Bruce Lyon and Victoria Stone when they were making certain charts and trying to look at the implications of the sphericity of planes and the sphericity of rays. And that's why I said making a sphere with a certain ring pass knot out of the four lower levels of the concrete mine, a great fifth ray separative disaster. Interesting thing is certain rays are connected with the brotherhood of darkness, ray one and five. Um, ray three and seven has been called connected with what's called the Jewish force. So I think somewhere in externalization of the hierarchy, uh, this is shown. And um, there are other listings there. Uh, but when one and five are connected psychopathologically, DK says it's such a psychopathology that it makes a man virtually untouchable. So great is the separation that he has engineered the ramparts of his form nature repel everybody. And any kind of relationship is simply arising out of manipulation and evil intent and not out of any natural affinity for love. He goes on to describe other psychopathologies by combining ray two, four, and six. You brood and brood and brood and then externalize something wonderful or terrible. And ray three and six, you attempt to impose your thoughts on everybody. So you become manic in the imposition of uh, your own perceptions upon others. You, you know, you preach and impose and basically uh, deny people their freedom because you are impressing your ideas upon them and won't let them have their own ideas. Those are the psychopathologies involved. I don't know if I can, well, I could give you a list of psychopathologies, ray by ray. Paranoia for ray one, masochism for ray two, the disorganized personality for ray three. There's a, you know, in that, in that book where they classify different diseases, 
there is such a thing as the disorganized personality, manic depression, ray four, ide fix, ray five. Oh, what, what can I call uh, ray five and six really together? Ray six is an unbending fanaticism, which as we all know, denies contact with the real. So you just, you know, basically convert or die. We've seen Christians do it. We've seen those in Islam do it. If you won't convert, you can cut your head off or whatever. Ray seven, obsessive compulsive neurosis. In psychological language, each ray has its psychopathologies and certain combinations of rays tend in those directions as well. For the, um, for the first, for the Black Lodge, Ray 1 and 5 are the signatures or the signatories. And basically the threat is the big explosion, nuclear war, Ray 1 and 5. And that's how they try to destroy the planet. And as Madame Rorick says, to float away on the wreck and then to enslave all of humanity. Not a very pretty picture. What was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, we've got we've got some other questions too, and it's yeah, yeah, it's Getting there. Uh, it's eleven minutes after the hour now. How many questions do we have? Um, two more at the present. All right, let's let's handle them quickly. Okay, Alexander writes. I have heard the term "ring pass knot" used for groups. Do you think it could be used this way? What could that be? What about the ring pass knot for the new group of world servers? Yes, abs absolutely. Because every look, what is a planet with its ring pass knot except a group phenomena? created by uh, group, groups of solar angels. And uh, so, the, the, you know, the, when, you, when you get the constituents of a group together and it becomes a uh, more and more unified whole, it has its central life, it has its radiation. It's kind of an in imitation of an ashram. An ashram has its radiation and it's ring past not. So it's not just an individual thing at all. It moves on through the various group phenomena, which describe planets and stars. And the whole group idea extends far, far beyond. The galaxy is a great group and it has its ring past not. It's got trillions of constituents in some cases. So certainly when you get individuals together to unite in purpose and do a certain general piece of work, uh, there is a, a ring pass knot for its radiation. Uh, hopefully for the new group of world servers, uh, increasingly and with technology that ring pass knot covers at a certain intensity, the entirety of the planet, at least the entirety of our globe. We can't say that our little new group of world servers is felt throughout the chain or throughout the entire planetary scheme, but throughout the globe, it could be felt. And the entirety of any, any group. Uh, you know, when you have a group uh, coming together, it's got its own radiation and it, and it goes beyond the physicality of its constituents, especially these days. So yes, I think so. And finally, Heike writes, I think wherever there is group consciousness, there is also a group ring pass knot, probably as seen from individuality level. Could there be a ring pass knot regarding a common goal in meditation and spiritual service? I see that, for example, in the EUN work. I would even think, feel, that Hitler and his group had a comp a kind of common ring pass knot. Yeah, yeah. But maybe yeah. you would call or define that sphere in another way? 
no, no. They had their ring, ring pass knot, and uh, it uh, perverted the Shambhala force because it had no love in it, uh, no real love. So it was a combination of the first and third ray, and all of the Nazi group had at least uh, the soul on the first sub ray. Uh, we are, we are told. And of course, they had a a world influence. But DK says, don't think of them and send love to them because they're much more powerful than you, and they will tune in on you, and it will be to your detriment. So obviously there was a kind of negative radiation that had uh, occult extensibility. Um, not, not just, you know, Aries, Aries soul misappropriated, not just running rampant uh, over the enemy, their enemies, but the radiation itself was extending throughout the psyche of humanity, and they too were the victims of the, of the ring past knot or the radiation of the Black Lodge. He said, um, you know, the very thing that has given Germany such wonderful music and philosophy and all that, it's Pisces personality, made, uh, uh, became negative. It's a negative sign in many ways and it absorbed easily the influence of the radiation of the Black Lodge. So yes, uh, that group predominantly of seven men had its esoteric radiation and a ring pass nod because they were so powerful that it went beyond their sheer physicality. Now they got together and had a common purpose, a world conquest and the you know, the domination of the so-called Aryan group. It was all a big glamour. There's no pure race today anywhere, says the Tibetan. But it was a form of egotism and selfishness and uh, negativity, ne negative response to the Shambhala force. Okay, friends. Thanks, Heike. Germany now, now is so different. You know, I got to say, the fourth ray is really coming through. I have, you know, there's so many people there that, that somehow are responding to the harmony through conflict, you know, and, and to the beauty. It, it's always had beauty in philosophy, you know, and now it emerges more. You know, the first ray Pisces personality bringing about a great twilight of the gods, you know, go to Demerung, you know, bringing that, it, it's fading out. Yeah, sorry, Michael, go ahead. And now you'd yeah. like to put up the great invocation and we can close the meeting. Um, afterwards, I'd like to meet briefly with you, Tuya and Joe. Okay, uh, great. But, um, sorry, here we go. And uh, of course, we know the great invocation, except when we forget. Okay. <clears throat> From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out 
and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. <clears throat> oh. Oh. Okay, friends, thanks so much. And um, we're, we're gonna stay on here, Michael, Tuya, and myself. Um, we're gonna stop the recording, but keep the, um, pause the recording rather, uh, but keep the general program so we can decide a few things. I'm pausing it right now, but you'll hear me. And tomorrow morning, uh, the um, Soul of Nations, Destiny of the Nations, and Sunday morning, uh, Attracting Financial Resources for Hierarchical Purposes. So thank you very much, and lots of love uh, and many blessings to all of you. Let's just keep learning and applying and meditating. We'll get there. Uh, we're already there, in a sense. Okay, I pause the recording now.